Welcome to the European Central Bank podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen. Today, in the third episode of our series on the economic and financial effects of the coronavirus pandemic, we're looking at the banking system. As we heard in previous episodes, our societies have had to take radical steps to save lives, effectively shutting down large parts of the economy. Banks are at the heart of economic activity, providing lending to homeowners and businesses who may suddenly find it difficult to make ends meet. Now, the ECB is in charge of supervising banks, and the person in charge of that is ECB Supervisory Board Chair Andrea Enria. Thanks, Andrea, for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Good afternoon. And um, we've obviously been mostly working remotely at the ECB, um, so I'm, I'm still at home. But uh, I think looking at the video just now, it looks like you're back in the office uh, with a, a nice EU flag behind you. Um, can you tell us where you are and, and how's the lockdown been for you? Yeah, I'm in the office today because there was a meeting of the supervisory board, but uh, it is one of the first days that I come back to the office. I've been uh, working alone from home in the last uh, two months and a half. Uh, and uh, so it is uh, really a new setting for me <laughs> coming back to the office uh, today. So it has been uh, it has been a quite a, a challenging environment, but also I I interesting to notice how everything worked uh, smoothly to a large extent, yes. How do you expect working life to change uh, once we're back to whatever the new normal looks like? Well, it is indeed impressive how smoothly this has worked. And uh, both in terms of uh, liaising with the staff, I've had daily meetings, for instance, with the daily management, with the COVID-19 team, I've had very frequent meetings with, uh, uh, with the supervisory board, fast decision making. I think that when we will uh, go back, it will be a new normal. I think that we will change uh, uh, significantly the way in which we interact. And this will be a, an advantage also for the working of the single supervisory mechanism or the liaison between us and the national authorities. Because after all, it has shown that uh, uh, the banking union is, uh, is working, is working well. That's the first test no? for the banking union of a crisis. And uh, I think that in the new working mode, we've been able to deliver uh, very fast. Now, so as we've seen, and we've already touched on it, the, the coronavirus outbreak has killed hundreds of thousands of people and it's transformed daily life and it's transformed working life. And um, we've all observed these restrictions to try to slow the spread of the virus. And that's also had a, a huge economic impact. We've seen economies slow down a lot. Could you talk us through a bit what the main challenges are that banks are facing due to this economic crisis linked to the health crisis? Yeah, uh, th there has been a first phase of the crisis in which the banks have faced a, a, a sudden and uh, substantial increase in credit demand, especially with customers uh, drawing on uh, on credit lines. They've also experienced at the same time the operational pressure of moving from, you know, the, the ordinary plain vanilla brick and mortar, let's say, banking in branches to a much more reliance on, on uh, remote operation. So uh, uh, this has meant pressure on capital, on liquidity, and also an increase in IT and cyber risk to some extent. The second phase, which is still the phase in which we are now, is a phase in which banks need to take lending decisions. And that's a crucial one. The whole policy measures which have been taken, monetary policy, supervisory measures, and government support measures, tend to support banks in an effort to lend to uh, customers, to the economy, lend to households, small businesses, corporates. So how they will take decisions now uh, in terms of balancing uh, the need to select viable customers on the one hand, but also avoid uh, you know, uh, restricting credit and uh, lending to the, to the economy as a whole and supporting the recovery is, is the major challenge they're facing right now. Okay, so there's this two two sided r risk really, right? So if they if they are lending too freely, they might take on lots of of of, of too too greater risks, which could in in the long term harm them. But on the other hand, if they don't lend enough, then that maybe exacerbates the economic situation, the the problems that are being faced. 
Yeah, exactly. It's a fine balance. No, on the one end, uh, banks might be tempted to be rather risk averse in these moments, so lend less because in this radical uncertainty they face, they might be concerned that maybe the customers uh, uh, would not pay them back. Uh, but if they they are excessively restrictive in their lending decisions, then the uh, the likelihood that uh, uh, small businesses, corporates will default uh, will be higher, and then the the crisis will be deeper, and then eventually also the repercussions on the bank's balance sheets will be tougher. So it's a, it's a delicate balance and a difficult challenge for banks to perform their functions in this uh, difficult uh, situation. Okay, and could you maybe just spell out why is it so critical that banks are able to 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 get through that to make that balance? They they manage to both lend enough and that um, that they get through the this second phase of the crisis in a decent shape. Yeah, this is a very peculiar crisis, no? Because in a sense, with the uh, lockdown, the distancing measures, the travel bans, uh, in important parts of our economies have been put in a freeze. So they're not working anymore. So firms really being unable to survive, die, jobs being lost. And eventually, once the crisis, the COVID-19, the pandemia is, is over, finding ourselves in a much lower productive capacity and with an economy which is much less dynamic and less strong than it was before. So the whole objective is to keep the economy alive and to avoid uh, an excess of insolvency. And this requires lending to these uh, small businesses, corporates to continue paying their bills, their electricity bills, their rents, uh, and to pay their their employees, basically. So all uh, these uh, measures are aimed at making sure that we help, let's say, the the real economy to cross the desert in a sense of uh, of this of this pandemia. So that's why lending is so important. But of course, in doing that, banks need also to make the difficult call of selecting those customers that. Uh, deserve this uh, support and those that instead are excessively weak and would not uh, were weak probably even before the crisis and would not be able to survive in the longer term so these are the difficult lending decisions that banks uh, will need to to make in the are making in these days actually okay so yeah so let's let's look at that because in the in the last two uh, episodes of the ecb podcast uh, we discussed our monetary policy measures with Chief Economist Philip Lane. Uh, and in the last episode, we also talked about a bit on the financial market impact uh, with Executive Board Member Isabel Schnabel. So if we just focus in on ECB banking supervision and the response we took there, can you talk us through w- what measures that you put in place? Yeah, we basically uh, took a, a quite a comprehensive package of measures Uh, First of all, we try to create space for the banks to lend. In the uh, new regulatory framework, which has been built after the last financial crisis, uh, we have distinguished between minimum requirements that banks need to respect at all times and buffers that banks need to build in good times to use in times of crisis. So buffers of capital, buffers of liquidity that needs to be available in case uh, a storm arrives in, in, and, and the banks are put under pressure. So uh, what we did basically was we told banks that they could use freely these, these buffers as uh, envisaged in the original design of the reforms. We also took measures to avoid what is called procyclicality, so the sort of an effect of of the rules that might exacerbate when there is a recession, the risks, the perception of risks uh, at uh, at banks. For instance, this is the case for uh, accounting standards, so the way in which banks measure the credit quality of the of the borrowers and we gave clear interpretation to the banks that they should look at the at the longer term viability of their customers not only at the pain they are suffering at the peak of the of the crisis and especially we gave the banks a lot of operational relief so not uh, try to reduce the reporting requirements uh, to reduce the specific supervisory requests that we are sending in their direction so that they can focus on the main task of the day. Mm-hmm. And so on that pro-cyclicality point, that's, that's a, 
where you're trying to take a, a policy that's basically there for good reason, that in, in good times you want them to be cautious, but actually, in, to put it in very blunt, blunt terms, to say, well, right now there's a crisis, so you need to have a better view on whether that lending risk is actually over the long term going to be as bad as it might look today. Does that is that too simplified, or do you want to nuance that a bit? No, no, it, 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 you are getting it right. So, for instance, if if a bank now is facing a, a customer that has payment difficulties, but these payment difficulties are temporary, and this customer can enjoy government guarantees on the loan, well, then we would invite the banks to take into consideration how temporary these difficulties are and how relevant the government guarantees from the governments could be in preventing losses hitting the bank's balance sheets in the future. Instead, if the banks were simply taking today's uh, picture and projecting these forward in the in the coming uh, months and years well then they would probably uh, conclude that uh, that customer is not uh, is not uh, viable and they would not uh, lend to this customer so uh, uh, the, the point is to have a balanced view and to take into consideration also the support measures which have been granted by governments in taking the the lending decisions Okay, and is there what is the advantage of doing this at a European level over um, the the old way pre twenty fourteen of doing it purely nationally? Well, you know, first of all, it's clear that uh, when national measures were taken before the previous crisis. Uh, there was a lot of uh, use of uh, supervisory tools to favor national champions. And these had, uh, to some extent, uh, created uh, competition between uh, supervisors that uh, led to a re- an excessive relaxation of the supervisory requirements. This time, in having European supervision, this did not happen. The banks started uh, this crisis with a much stronger level of capital and liquidity uh, which enabled them to uh, to avoid uh, becoming an element of further strengthening of the shock. So in the past, the banks have, have become uh, the origin of the problem and they helped uh, spreading the shock throughout the economy. This time, they are operating in the opposite way. There has been a shock which has come from outside the banking sector and the banks have continued lending to their customers enabling them to withstand the first uh, the first phase of the crisis that has been an incredible difference uh, from uh, from the past the second difference has been that there has been a much uh, faster reaction it might seem difficult uh, because and, and surprising because we are operating in a multi country setting also in our supervisory board but it was very easy to get together and take a very strong decision very fast and giving certainty to the market and avoiding you know banks uh, cherry picking between different uh, jurisdictions so it has been a unified response it has been very fast and this has, has helped uh, markets to see that there was an immediate policy response uh, which was not the case in the past, where every authority uh, went out on its own uh, course of action. And you've talked already about this, that you, the one, you want the banks themselves to be walking this tightrope between lending enough but not, but not lending uh, recklessly. How do you manage collectively then to make sure that you're sort of not being too generous to the banks and allowing too much risk to build up? Look, I mean, th- th- there could be a misperception here that we have been, uh, you know, changing the stance of uh, uh, of supervision. Uh, actually, what we have been doing has been exactly in line with the design of the regulatory reforms which have been designed and put in place after the last crisis. So the idea that supervision should become less procyclical, that uh, supervision should also be able to increase the safety of uh, Uh, of the banks in good times, but also allow them to deepen the buffers, use capital, use liquidity to support the economy when a big recession like the one we are experiencing right now comes. Uh, But we have been uh, shifting our focus. I mean, uh, instead of running the, for instance, the usual uh, supervisory processes as we did in the past, uh, we focus them much more on the specific risks that the banks are facing during the COVID-19 crisis and on their ability to manage those risks. Changing the topic very slightly, but but also something that's 
particularly to do with the crisis that you, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. The, the sudden change in people not being able to go into bank branches, everyone working from home, has created this sort of uh, something that some people might call a sort of forced digitalization. Some, um, and that comes with its own specific risks for banks, which are maybe not always famous for having the, the newest computer systems. Uh, and it's something that I think you've looked at a bit from a supervisory uh, perspective. Can you tell us about that a bit? Yes, I think that uh, this is an opportunity, I would say, also for the banks. So we have been arguing for a long time before this crisis that uh, banks which have been more effective in terms of uh, uh, refocusing their business model, investing in new technologies, adopting digital distribution channels uh, with their customers, and, uh, and being more effective in, in terms of reducing costs uh, and cutting sometimes also branches, have been the banks uh, uh, for several years now, uh, which have proven to be more profitable, we have always argued that banks should focus on these uh, on these tasks. And now uh, what you call, Michael, forced digitalization has offered an opportunity to them to uh, focus more on these topics. So I hope that uh, instead of coming back to the old normal, they will also take this opportunity to rethink their way of uh, operating and to uh, reconsider their uh, use of technologies also in the in the in their in their day-to-day -day operation. And there were many banks, let's be honest, that, that has been for a long time a, a major supervisory concern. Many, many, many banks that were not even uh, able to uh, aggregate data that were dispersed in different, uh, you know, databases. Uh, this has been a big issue in the past. Okay. And whilst they're doing that, one other thing I guess they should look at and uh, that you've highlighted is, uh, as well as the risk of cyber uh, attacks and, 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 and cyber risk generally, right? Because if more things are online, there's obviously more vectors for, for attack. Yeah, this, this has become a, a priority for the ECB supervision uh, at least uh, for two years. We have this as one of the top priorities in our risk map. So we have been focusing a lot on, uh, uh, on IT and cyber risk. We have had a number of uh, uh, on-site examinations. We have a, a, an incident reporting system which has become more and more effective and which we're using also now in the COVID times. At the moment, we have noticed a little bit of increase but not a major, uh, let's say, regime change in terms of uh, cyber attacks, which means that banks have been preparing uh, more. But, you know, uh, there are indeed uh, risks uh, that we have uh, identified uh, specifically in this crisis that will need to be, to be uh, covered uh, going forward. For instance, many, many banks have been outsourcing uh, IT functions uh, to emerging countries where uh, the, the ability to work uh, remotely has proven to be much more limited than, than in, uh, in their home country. So this has generated some hiccups in the functioning of the systems during the crisis. So there, there are a number of lessons on which, from which we, we need to learn uh, also on, on IT risk and cyber risk going forward. Thank you, Andrea. And we wish you all the best as you oversee this journey of the banks across the desert of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. This brings us to the end of this episode. We've seen that banking supervisors across Europe are working closely with banks to ensure that they can continue to fulfil their key tasks as lenders, and they will play an important role in helping us come out of the crisis. As usual, we'll link to related information in the show notes, including our new web pages with an overview of the measures we have taken to counter the economic impact of the pandemic. Do also listen to episode four of the ECB podcast with Andrea Enria and other supervisors where we delve a bit deeper into what banking supervision actually entails. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You can use direct messages and comments. You've been listening to the European Central Bank podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.